you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls alike, welcome to the giant big top of podcasts uh, here in the uh, internet sky, uh, as they like to call it, the intertubes in the sky, as some senators or what was it, House members call it. Uh, welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. Remember, and you might want to tattoo this to, uh, I don't know, a part of your body. Uh, I can't offer it as some sort of service, you know, what you can get for free. You'll have to pay for it, your local tattoo artist. But you might want to just remember this. The Chris Voss Show is a family that loves you but doesn't judge you. What kind of better family can it be? What more do you people want from me, for hell's sakes? I mean, not, not even your mother-in-law likes you that much. So there you go. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, forward slash Chris Voss, youtube.com, forward slash Chris Voss, and linkedin.com, forward slash Chris Voss. I have no idea why I give more accent to YouTube. It just sounds funnier and funner. We have an amazing guest on the show, and he's going to blow your mind, open your open the veins in your brain. <laughs> I think I just invented a new shirt for the show. Open the veins in your brain. He's going to expand the blood flow to a point that you're going to think more intelligent thoughts beyond what you've ever thought before. And, and I know most of you listen to the show for almost 15 years. Uh, and you're like, Chris, I, how can I get any smarter? Well, we keep bringing you two to three new guests a day. And uh, there's just there's much more room. I, what is it they say? We only use like 5% of our brains. I think most people listen to the Chris Voss show use about 10% or something, but, uh, I'm, I'm getting a notification from the attorneys. I can't legally say that. Anyway, hey guys, uh, he is an amazing author. He's got his newest book that comes out August 22nd, 2023. And he's been sitting here listening to me ask his, my audience uh, to beg them for plugs and five-star reviews on iTunes uh, for a while here. Uh, the name of the book is called how many segues can I do on this damn show? The name of the book is called Containing Big Tech, How to Protect Our Civil Rights, Economy, and Democracy. Hey, these sound like cool things to, to protect. Uh, the book is, uh, the author is called Tom Kemp, and he joins us on the show today, and he's going to expand your mind. And if he doesn't, well, we'll we'll just, you can, you can call him and ask for your money back. Uh, Tom is the Silicon Valley based CEO, entrepreneur, and investor. Uh, Tom was the founder and CEO of Centrify, named, uh, renamed Delinea in 2022. He's a leading cybersecurity cloud provider. Uh, they were, they were a, uh, that amounts, uh, I'm just having a midday, aren't I? Uh, amassed over 2000 enterprise customers, including over 60% of the Fortune 50. Uh, for his leadership, Tom was named Ernst & Young as a finalist for the Entrepreneur of the Year in Northern California. Uh, Tom is also an active Silicon Valley angel investor with seed investments in over a dozen tech startups. Welcome to the show, Tom. How are you doing? I'm doing great. That's an amazing introduction. I That's the best <laughs> one yet. So I fumbled a little bit through your, uh, through your uh, uh, bio there, but you know, we try to make it sound fun, and and this is the second show of the day, so uh, I can't feel my feet. Uh, but yeah. welcome to the show. Give us your .com so we can find you on the interwebs, please. Yeah, I'm at TomKemp.ai. There you go, Tom Kemp dead AI. You got your your corner of the AI market. That's the that's the that's, hottest new thing. That's uh, that's where there. it's at, baby. There you go. So, Tom, uh, let's start out. Uh, what motivated you to write this book? Well, I've been in Silicon Valley 30 years. I started a bunch of companies. I've been doing a bunch of policy work, uh, including helping pass uh, the California Proposition 24, which gave California the, the, the nation's best and first privacy law. And I've just seen a lot of bad stuff happening, and I kind of figured that uh, I could put forth a book uh, that hopefully gives readers a clear path forward to help them and help the country rein in online surveillance, AI, and, and tech monopolies. There you go. Containing 
big tech. And uh, so is there some going on with uh, our civil rights, the economy and, and democracy that maybe Silicon Valley isn't uh, always uh, having the best interest for? Look, uh, we've now have five large big tech companies. We got Meta, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and certainly they've built innovative com uh, products. They're innovative companies. Uh, it improves many aspects of our lives. But what's happening now is the intrusiveness and our dependence on them have really created some pressing threats. And it first starts with the majority of these vendors' business model, which is to collect as much information about us as possible. Now, in the past, it was about serving advertising. But what we're seeing now is that data collection is being weaponized against us. Um, and it's kind of scary, like the amount of data, the sensitivity of the data. And then now you throw in AI, which sucks up that data and really, you know, starts generating things and personalizing things and, and, and makes their products more addictive. And if anyone were to use TikTok, they would probably agree that it's pretty darn uh, addicting. Oh, yeah. And, and then finally, look, the fact is, is that these companies have evolved into monopolies and their monopoly positions in the market actually exasperate the problems of privacy, digital surveillance, AI bias and exploitation, et cetera. So I just wanted to put it all together, connect the dots, not only just, but not be a Debbie Downer and say, ah, the, you know, here's all the problems. But I also wanted to provide solutions both for individuals as well as policymakers. There you go. That's what we need more of is solutions and people, you know, you can bang on, you know, this is wrong or stuff isn't right. But having those solutions there is really important. So uh, what what uh, give us a little bit about your hero's journey, your story and your background. What, what led you to this point? What got you involved in Silicon Valley and interested in technology? Yeah, so I, I grew up in Michigan. I went to the University of Michigan, go blue, and uh, it was a history, but also a computer science major. And uh, I just wanted to go out to Silicon Valley and, and see what it's about. Uh, and then when I got here, it was just amazing, the entrepreneurial spirit. And so uh, started my career at a, 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 it wasn't that big of a tech company at the time, Oracle. Uh, oh, I've heard they had, of them. Yeah, they had just gone public a, a few years uh, before I had joined. Uh, and then I started doing startups, right? And you know, and then my last company, uh, I, I founded it, was CEO, raised about ninety million dollars in venture capital money. Um, and then from there, you know, Silicon Valley actually, people, entrepreneurs support other entrepreneurs, and so I'm I'm a pretty active angel investor, which which means I give uh, seed investments, so I write checks out of my own uh, bank account to. Uh, other entrepreneurs and help them start their way as well. But, you know, with all the goodness and, and all the hype about Silicon Valley and, and me living and breathing this here, you know, I start, I got the thinking is like, you know, it's a double-edged sword, right? Mm. That, uh, you know, what we have now is, especially with the large tech companies, their products are free, right? But they're actually, you become the product, right? Yeah. Because it's your data and their actual customer, you're not the customers, the customers are at, are the advertisers. Um, and then people are finding ways to exploit that. And then as our laws have changed, um, then it actually gets to the point where there could be discrimination and, and other things that, that occur. And I just wanted to just uh, have some, my perspective on this, uh, as opposed to some sort of academic, you know, talking about this. There you go. Do you discuss AI and some of the complications and maybe ways that we can resolve, you know, different AI seems to be this quite emerging technology that's kind of the wild west a little bit right now. Yeah. You know, I, I'm actually, it was kind of fortunate because uh, a lot of my companies that I've invested in, plus the, the companies that I started really started investing AI a number of years ago. And I just kind of felt that when I was writing this book last year, that I could see that the large tech players were making very large investments. And it's clearly exploded. Everything's, you know, chat GPT, uh, Dolly, you know, this whole generative stuff. But, but AI has been around for a long time. And so I really wanted to explain what AI is to, to people. I wanted to tell people how it could be used, especially like in the medical space, incredibly positive things that, that are happening, uh, you know, in, in areas such as that. But 
because humans write AI, bias can seep in or it can be exploited. And you probably are familiar with the concept of deep fakes, right? And there's yeah. like deep fake pornography, et cetera. So, uh, and there's things called dark patterns that trick people and fool people. So there's good, but we do need to put guardrails to make sure that we don't become exploited by this technology that basically is getting closer and closer to to thinking like humans and 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 you know when we have one of those when we have some of that stuff we probably need to put a few guardrails in hi folks here's Foss here with a little station break hope you're enjoying the show so far we'll resume here in a second uh i'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website you can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com over there you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements if you'd like to hire me uh training courses that we offer and coaching for leadership management entrepreneurism uh podcasting corporate stuff uh with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as ceo and be sure to check out chris Voss leadership institute.com now back to the show there you go I, in fact i just posted on my facebook today uh and it was from august 7th from wire magazine criminals have created their own chat gpt cl clones and they're uh they're running around basically using them as as fake scams and ways to collect their own data probably for uh, uh illicit uses um and and so yeah there's a lot of stuff going on you know one of the uh, books like yours that offer solutions are really important because you look at uh when, when people go to congress and talk to these congressmen they have no clue what's going on and then they don't have no clue what's going on when people go talk to them in the congress and and you know about the problems you know you see the it's almost like a, a carnival you know when the when the senator house members saying if i move the phone over here do you know exactly you know weird shit like that where you're just like you have no idea what's going on and you're you're the guy who's supposed to regulate these people on these companies yeah no it was really funny i remember i mean we all know like uh senator the late senator orrin hatch you know said well how do you make money mark zuckerberg and <laughs> you know, we, we, we do advertising, right? But but just recently, you know, the uh, CEO of Google was being asked by a congressperson like, OK, tell me about this iPhone thing. Right. You know, and I got this problem with this iPhone. And like his response was, uh, uh, Congressman, we don't do iPhone. Right. You know, you know? Uh, so, know do. yeah. And, and so, you know, part of it was was that not only for for individuals, but providing a road just try to like you know like explain it to your uncle larry or someone that cares etc so I, I i wanted to boil it down connect the dots and so an average politician could read this and say aha i get it this is why we need a privacy law this is why we need to guardrails this is why we need to address some monopoly issues because the reality is is that here in Silicon Valley, we have no fly zones for startups. Like, wow. like people will just like if I come to say you're an investor and say, "Hey, I got this great idea for a, a search engine," you just start laughing, right? Because who's <laughs> going to compete against Google, right? Or yeah. I got a, I got a great idea for a mobile operating system. I mean, uh -huh. people just laugh because you can't compete with it right there. And so we now have major sectors of our economy that are off limits to people such as myself in Silicon Valley. And so having such concentration of power is also of significant concerns and, and exasperates the problems of surveillance and, and AI when you have all the eggs in one basket. Hey, I've got a I've got an idea for Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and no fly zone sort of stuff. Uh, I I want to buy a uh, texting social media company for uh, for five times its uh, true value, uh, and then run off the advertisers, and then eventually <laughs> run it into bankruptcy. Oh shit, that's already been done. I I I, I, I forgot. Okay, yeah, all right. That's a no fly zone there. Uh, Twitter but, X, whatever the fuck well, it's called. This here, week. here in Silicon Valley, there's a saying: if you know, how can you make a small fortune? Start with a large fortune, <laughs> oh, right? And so I think he has he. 
he has enough fortune to be able to to write that off. Sure, uh, yeah. to, he should he should probably stick to satellites and cars versus uh, social cool. media. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, I mean, you got to have that write off pet project, right? I mean, you got to you know you got to have that deduction for the taxes. Uh, so there you go. But it's fun to watch. It's kind of like cops or uh, or cheaters. Uh, it's fun. It's, it's more fun. like a slow motion slow crash. Motion crash. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> likes watching that. You just you just tune into that. I used to do a thing with cops where I would watch cop. Anytime I was depressed and I, I just, I was like, my life is horrible. Everything is wrong. I'm just, so, I just should give up. And then you watch cops for two hours and you're like, my life is fucking awesome. Look at these people. <laughs> anyway. Uh, hey, you know, whatever turns the wheels. So uh, give us some different steps. You know, I, I think a lot of people talk about, they have this attitude that like, well, I'm sure they're big companies and they'll do the right thing. You know, <laughs> is there a fallacy with people that believe that, you know, money and, bigness means a company will do the right thing well the, the problem is is that you're not their customer you're oh. their product oh. right? so Damn it kind of starts from that right so they're they're very much focused on satisfying who their customers are which is advertisers which th they say oh you want to advertise to women between the age and 20 and 30 that are pregnant right and they can like slice and dice and they can give you that targeted advertising just like we're so used to we we shop for a uh, red shoes and for the next five weeks you know every web page has a red shoe they're really good at that right yeah. but the problem is is that if you can target someone you know women 20 with young kids etc you can use that to exclude people from ads for rental units from mm -hmm. loans etc so they don't see that that's that's where the weaponization can begin and then you know to be not wanting to get overly political but we're in a post abortion rights america and now stuff that you used to be able to do in terms of your google search am i pregnant you know where's you know this that and the other thing that's now illegal in some states right wow. you know and so that data can be used against you right mm -hmm. and so then it becomes like do we really need to cl collect is it really safe and sane to collect all this information and i don't in some cases i don't think they set out to be evil but they don't understand the unintended consequences uh, especially uh, the best example of this is they design products for their fellow tech bros right they don't realize that kids are signing up to this yeah. and kids cannot get out of rabbit holes when all those ads and all those postings kind of push them in a certain direction towards drugs or alcohol or, or now we have a lot of conspiracy theories etc because that's the stuff that that people like and it gets amplified etc and so uh, yeah it was cool that the algorithmic amplification was for the cat video right but now it, it's for other things and that's just not healthy for society there you go and the, the dopamine hits that social media has delivered the algorithms have delivered uh sheer manipulation i mean on one hand i mean it's entertaining but i've been one of those people especially during covid when we were in lockdown where i would you know start i go to bed about an hour one or two or something and i start flipping through tiktok and then suddenly the sun's up and you're like what the fuck just happened yeah and uh so you know it's it's one of those things and where you and I probably grew up in a world where we didn't have, you know, we probably were spin dialing phones. Um, we didn't have these, you know, constant beep, 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 notification, notification. You know, we had this semblance of human interaction, looking at each other face to face, talking, meeting, you know, there was all of that. But now these kids, they're being raised on, uh, on a thing. You know, we've had people on the show that are um, scientists and they said one of the biggest problems that we have is, we're really not genetically designed or, or we haven't adapted to looking at 2D screens. We're used to looking at each other's faces and seeing, you know, the blink, the the movement. And and there's and also being close to each other and feeling each other's energy or vibe or seeing it, touching each other, hold, shaking hands. This is why politicians shake hands and kiss babies. There's something to the touch that we have. And so all these people are, you know, it, it, it kind of, uh, I think, desensitizes people. Look, uh, here, here's the deal. The, the motivation of their business models are to serve ads and to better serve ads, it's to collect as much information 
and to keep you on as long as possible. So it becomes a hamster wheel, right? Mm -hmm. And you're right that, you know, people say TikTok knows me better than I know myself, right? <laughs> and so so each each video that you're watching, the, uh, TikTok is actually collecting, you know, your swipes, your likes, et cetera, and they're feeding that into the algorithm. And so we as humans, it's very hard to uh, adapt because, for example, if we see a flashing red light, you know, that's that's danger and we're used to that. But now our phone is like lighting up like a Christmas tree with all these notifications. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the problem is, is that kids, because they're they're the oh, boy, you know, kids don't want to miss you know fear of missing out. Right. Yeah. And so if they get that notification at 10 o'clock at night, of course, they need to look at it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we I think another fundamental thing that I bring up in the book, I have a whole chapter on this, is that that. We've, in the end, have designed, we have, in the physical world, we've designed things with kids in mind, right? That's why we have, you know, kids' car seats, right? That's why lead paint. That's why, you know, look at the jungle gyms from when we were a kid, all concrete, and, you know, everyone had a broken arm uh, by the time they graduated. But now they're all, you know, wood chips and stuff things but we don't do that in the online world right yeah. it's the same user interface for 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 kids and they're the most susceptible and you know they give most into peer pressure etc so i think i'm just trying to raise awareness but i also trying to provide solutions like hey here's things that we can do um mm -hmm. and, it, and it turns out tech really wants to keep it comp oh it's so complex and all that no actually there's some really simple solutions there um, you go yeah you know and, and even worse what you mentioned with the hamster wheel i need to tape that to the top of my phone get off the hamster wheel dummy <laughs> maybe tattoo it to my thumb so that when i'm sitting there on the phone um the uh you know here here's what's worse they've trained me not only to do the hamster wheel but to run the hamster wheel on myself. So with TikTok, I've learned that what I watch for any sort of length of time beyond a few seconds, they're going to keep feeding me more of that. So if I see something stupid, annoying, or ignorant, because I don't like everything, I'm pretty particular, uh, that comes through my feed, I know, hey, you need to swipe that really quick, because otherwise TikTok's going to feed the idiot more of that. And so I've learned to train the algorithm to my, onto myself. Is that like not like you're you're like, you're, hack, you're hacking the algorithm? <laughs> I mean, you're basically you're trying to yeah. hack the algorithm, and but the, the but it gets worse from a society perspective. Is that everyone is trying to hack the like take search for example, mm -hmm. the most like everyone now tells you just oh you got to write your web page or your blog for SEO perspective because you want it higher ranked, and so everything is now becoming more and more artificial, and then in terms of to feed the algorithm so the content gets there so clickbait floats to the top then google amazon are saying well if you really want to be on the top you have to pay us and so if you compare the google search result page from 10 or 15 years ago to now before it was so simple with a few little ads in the corner now it's just like ads all over the place okay yeah. so so we have a fundamental problem in which the tech companies, um, we're, we're adjusting our lives, we're adjusting our content to the tech companies. And now we're in a situation is that people are using AI to create fake books in the names of authors on Amazon, right? Oh, just really? the, Oh yeah, people are doing like fake travel books. It was in the New York Times yeah, yesterday. Yeah, I just saw the, two, the travel one, yeah. yeah are they putting so those in the name of the... Big, Sometimes big in the name or a oh. like name, a like a similar name, like mm -hmm. best guidebook to France. And wow. they use they use AI to scrape the, the, this together. It's all print on demand and, and it's wow. it, it's it's being faked. And so we have this downward spiral of inauthenticity and then AI can further exasperate it. And again, th there needs to be more pressure put on the tech companies to to actually provide more filtering, especially uh, of fraudulent uh, posts and uh, and and products. You know, I realized when I was discussing with telling you how TikTok has actually trained me to game myself. Uh, I it, it gave me this uh, this this image in my head that started with, "Wow, I'm I'm a I'm a person who lives in a prison." And uh, I think it's special that I get to pick my jail cell and I go to my jail cell every day and then lock myself in it. Like I don't even have to have jailers. I'm just doing it to myself. And then when I want to, I go out of my TikTok jail cell 
and I go over to my Twitter jail cell and I'm gaming all of these. So I'm designing my jail cells so they look pretty and they're very comfortable. But really, I'm living in in what you're talking about in your book, where you know I've I've got certain civil rights I need to be concerned about. I've got my privacy and different things. But I'm literally wandering out a giant technological uh, tube in the sky of jail cells, where I'm going. Well, let's go to Facebook jail cell today and sit in here for a while and figure out how we can make this look a little bit better. But I'm going to lock myself in here and and I'm actually going to be the monkey who uh, runs the jail cell, but puts myself in a cell. Yeah. That, so that I, seem think, I, I, I think insane. I think no, you're right. I, but the key thing is the key solution is, is that they keep you in the jail cell by personalizing things. And yeah. the personalization is based on data. So the key thing is, and I talk about this in the book, is you need to reduce your digital exhaust, your data footprint. OK. Mm -hmm. And there's ways that you can actually do that, that dramatically cut back by just flipping a few switches. Like on the iPhone, they introduce this app tracking transparency, ATT, not to be confused with AT&T, where you block third-party trackers. Mm -hmm. When Apple announced that, the next earnings call that Meta had, the owner of Facebook said, we're going to be short $10 billion in revenue because of the data flow being cut off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, on Google, which is basically an advertising company, on the Android devices, they don't have something similar to ATT to, to block third-party trackers. But you can download uh, a product called DuckDuckGo. It's an alternative browser. You don't have to use it for browser, but it also blocks the tracking that happens. And so all of a sudden, your data footprint of all this data going to the big tech companies and, and data brokers gets dramatically reduced. And then another thing you can do is on your PC, there's a free plugin from a, a privacy um nonprofit called EFF called Privacy Badger. It blocks all the third party cookies and tracking. Once you put those in place, oh my gosh, you actually no longer start seeing the red dress or the red shoes or the toilet that you shopped for <laughs> three months ago, you know, showing up on every website, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it dramatically reduces your footprint, which means the personalization stops to keep you uh, on the hamster wheel. There you go. Uh, you know, uh, one of the other things, too, is you and I grew up in an era where the stuff we did as kids uh, that may have been a little nefarious. You know, I think I stole a candy bar when I was five and my mom made me go back and take it back. And and uh, I was crying. And of course, I was like five or so, seven or something. I remember being just a child and I, I took a candy bar because I was, I don't know, you know I don't think I even completed to understand what the whole concept of money and stuff was and uh but she took me back and taught me a good lesson i learned but you know i mean stuff like that isn't on the internet and i've seen these employers now that have these tools where they can scrape like all of your social media accounts they can do a deep dive of seemingly every place you've been i've seen some pretty interesting ones and then hold it against you and and be like oh well you know in 1995 you I don't know, you, uh, I don't know, told someone to F off or something, you know. Uh, we saw a lot of that with the Me Too era where, you know, stuff that people were doing. I mean, there was, there was some very egregious things that needed to be addressed there and, and some really horror monsters. But, I mean, you had people, you're going to like, at 95, you use the N-word. Um, do we, how do we, how do we square that? How do we reconcile that? Is, is, is the person in 1995 still the same person today, et cetera, et cetera? So, um you know, how do we resolve some of that? How do we square some of that paradigm where, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know about holding it against people's rights for jobs. It seems like there's some issues there. If you're, you know, somebody's, you know, I don't know, they don't like the flavor of ice cream that you post on your Facebook or something. I don't know. Well, that's a big issue um, because you're, you're right that uh, an employer, I mean, yeah, there's one thing about, yeah, you don't want to, a crazy racist, you know, join your, your company, right? yeah. um, uh, et cetera, right? You know, or I, a racist so, running your HR department that's making it, it Yeah, or, or are you, you know, uh, uh, there, certainly there, there's value right there. But if you're posting photos of uh, on social that, hey, great news, um, I'm uh, I'm pregnant, right? And an employer looks at that and they can say, ah, oh, I don't know if I necessarily want to uh, hire a woman. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the issue right there. So again, mm -hmm. it's like people don't think about 
and, I don't, and the tech companies also don't think about the 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 unintended consequences and so mm -hmm. their motivation is to build what they call a network effect which is get more users and then once more users on it it attracts other people as well and so their motivation is by default to have everyone's social profile set to public right mm. which is terrible when a child signs up because you have creepoids you know, purposely looking for public profiles of uh, kids that are clearly mm -hmm. underage. Um, and then also you have what you, the scraping going on where background check companies will add that to their arsenal of, we'll also scan social, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll dig up that photo when you, you got completely drunk and you threw <laughs> up and they may say, I don't want this, you know, this yeah. alcoholic or whatever, but that was the one time in college you drank too much, right? Yeah. And so my recommendation, you know, further to reduce the data footprint is, is that you actually have, you cannot put your social stuff as public, right? That's mm -hmm. a, a, with the exception of something like more of a professional setting like LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and for God's sakes, please, if you send a resume, make sure it syncs with whatever you have in LinkedIn. Uh, I've seen so many cases <laughs> of people like having uh, the resume and then something separate in LinkedIn as well. And people saying, wait a minute right there. So you, you just have to become more conscious, but it's, it's about reducing the data footprint. And then just, if you do want to have a public persona, make it more of a professional one. There you go. Whatever you lied about on your resume, make sure you lie about it on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> I used to, to. Be I used to be really good at finding out bullshit in people's resumes. Uh, and, and a lot of times the, their dates, there'll be dates and, and uh, different things. Uh, let me ask you about this because I've dated all my life. Um, and I remember the first time that I had a girlfriend send me a, a sexting pic. And I remember thinking in my head, cause I own lots of companies and I, I don't know how that's pertinent, but I remember my head thinking, this, this, this is going to go all wrong if people start doing this, like, because you've sent me something that's public. If, if I, if I ever, if we ever broke up and I want to be an asshole, you know, uh, I could do this. If I sent you something, you could do that. You know, I, I there's, I, I don't want my body parts on the internet, but I'm kind of old world, you know, like I said, uh, before, but the thing I see in dating now, cause I'm single and I've dated all my life is this trend, especially with young people where they're sending body parts to each other uh, over Snapchat, like it goes out of style. In fact, it's really big with a lot of the guys that hit on young ladies that go, hey, uh, send me your Snapchat. And of course, the, the images start coming. And well, these are a lot of young people. I've kind of, I've started talking about this for a while now where I'm like, we're going to have a generation of people that are so used to sexting each other and these images are stored somewhere on the internet, if not on phones and people's Google drives and, you know, like on my photos go up to Google photos for my dogs and stuff. Um, and we're going to have, you know, somebody running for a house speaker of Congress or a politician or president of the United States, man or woman. And somebody's going to go, hey, I got a really cool picture of uh, something very private about them that they sent me in 19, 2001. And, you know, these people are going to be 40 years old. They're going to have a wife and kids or a husband and kids. And uh, they're trying to maybe do some serious, you know, CEO of IBMs, you know, whatever. And they're going to have these naked images floating around. And, and I'm astounded by how much scale there is to it. And so... I don't know if that fits into your idea of privacy and civil rights well, and stuff. It, it, it does. I mean, I, actually, you know, when when you and I are a kid, we we took a technology class, and that was called typing, right? <laughs> um, and that was actually my favorite class in high school. And I was like, I'm going to, like, out-type everyone else. I forget <laughs> what my, you know, like this. I mean, that was my you know, my, my uh, competitive juices went out, but I really do think we actually need to have, a, you know, have kids take a course in high school about, mm. you know, modern day technology and explain to them that, you know, how these companies make money, how you can be scammed. I mean, one of the, the big scams going around is interns mm. um, that, that join a company over college and all of a sudden they're getting texts from the CEOs of the company and say, Hey, I, I'm in a lunch meeting. Can you run out and, oh, yeah. uh, uh, get me an Apple gift card and then 
you know, send it to me and I'll pay you back because I'm in a, I'm busy in the meeting. And of course, you're like the the 19 year old intern. You're like, oh, you know, you, you drop everything, you run, you spend a couple hundred dollars, and all of a sudden you've been scammed out of uh, uh, you know five hundred thousand dollars of of gift cards. Um, and uh, so there's the whole fraud that's going on, the phishing, the fraud that's going on. Um, but then there's also that people just don't understand the consequences of oversharing information and how it can resurface. Because once it's on the internet, it's it's Everybody. stored somewhere. It's uh. there's no, I mean, even like you Snapchat, someone's got a phone and click right, and they're taking a photo of of your phone. Um, and so, you know, people need to be aware, especially at the younger ages, that um, just like we were taught. You know, shop class. We're taught typing. Uh, we need a tech. We need a you know tech safety hygiene uh, course. There you go. Uh, the OnlyFans. Uh, women have dabbled in the OnlyFans, and most OnlyFans don't make a lot of money. Actually, if you and, and do the stats, you know, there's a lot of people complaining now. They're like, oh, I didn't understand that if I started that, it's now on the internet forever, and it's impacting my ability to get jobs. It's people, people, well, or people, you do, you do it once people record it and mm -hmm. then, then they, they offer it for free. And yeah. so you, you may have gotten that $20, $25, it's, et cetera, but now it, it's, it's, it's out there, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. So it's, uh, and then the thing is, or they'll record it and then they'll use AI to, you know, slightly change the voice, the mm -hmm. image it, it's, et cetera. So look, I mean, we do need to better educate people about, you know, how data is collected and can be used against people. And it starts with identity theft. It starts with potential, you know, digital redlining and discrimination. Like, to your point, like people are not getting jobs um, or not getting a loan because of something that may have been posted or some data that uh, implies that uh, they, they can't pay it, et cetera. And, and most of the data that, especially these data brokers have, 50% of the data is incorrect, but, but decisions oh, wow. are being made based on it. Yeah. I've even, you know, I've had friends and, and myself, we've Googled ourselves in, in uh, AI and you're like, you have, have the wrong guy and you have mm -hmm. the wrong data and you've mixed this guy with that guy. And like yeah. some and 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 you're just like wow i hope this gets better but they call um, it hallucinating it's called ai it is? there's a term in silicon valley it's called ai hallucination wow. and the and the funny thing is like the term sounds like it's actually a cool term like oh he's hallucinating like he's on drug like it's a good trip he's having a good trip but but you're but actually it's not good right when you actually uh put something in chat gpt and like tell me more about this individual and it gets the information wrong um and uh you know ai can further be used for, not only for identity theft but but further push out disinformation uh and misinformation uh in society so we do we need personal guardrails but we also need policy guardrails and the scary thing mm -hmm. is is that in the united states unlike all the other major countries we do not have a national online privacy law okay oh. now i'm in i'm in california i i worked on the campaign to pass the california privacy rights act in 2020 so we're one of now 12 states but the other 38 states in the u.s do not have a comprehensive privacy law so i have the right to tell a business to delete my data. But if mm. you're in Alabama a bit, and you say, I want you to delete my data, th th that the business can actually say, no, I don't have to delete your data. And it's like, mm. we, we need a basic online bill of rights um, you know, for the digital age. And it's been frustrating that we don't have that yet uh, you know, at the federal level. Yeah, it's frustrating that the, the you know these big companies they can just lean on the politicians and of course fund them and buy all this stuff. You know we've had a lot of discussion that with uh, Citizens United and SCOTUS and different things. Uh, so uh, any 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 suggestions you want to tease out? Do you think we need to do to uh, to uh, relegate stuff? I mean, uh, obviously democracy is a big thing in the news right now. We're we're dealing with you know having our elections being leaned on in 2016 by. Oh, I can't remember the name of the companies, but you know, I mean, Brexit and and us went through that with uh, yes. Facebook and stuff like that, uh, and and of course, uh, social media was used for January six, and so that's being litigated right now. But definitely, you know, protecting our voting, protecting our elections, protecting truth—that seems to be the hardest thing to do anymore. 
Well, I think the key thing is actually I do have one proposal, um, and uh, let me run it by you, which is. And this actually comes up even with like at colleges and high schools. Uh, I, a family friend had a daughter and she was told to in high school and she was told to write an essay like how to get into a good college. And she wrote a very funny essay, which is I'm going to move to Montana. I'm going to take up the bassoon, like trying to f- play the whole <laughs> demographics thing. Right. And I mean, that was a funny. You're laughing. It was funny. Yeah. You know what the teacher said? Oh, this is too funny. It was written by AI. And so she was accused of that. Right. And wow. then she had it, then it got escalated. And so, but now what about political ads or things that, that are happening? Um, and so I fundamentally believe that we need the ability for us to take a document, an image, a URL, and be able to ask the large uh, generative AI providers, did you generate this? Yes or no? Like, mm. Take a URL and go to you know OpenAI slash verify. Put the URL in, hit go, and it has to come back and said, uh, "No, I didn't generate it," or "Yes, I generated this on uh, August third at two thirty eight p.m." Uh. And that. So what we need is with AI, we need transparency, right? Mm-hmm. Is it real or is it human? I also feel like when we're with a, on an online chat or even talking to someone on the phone, sometimes you get the feeling like when you're talking to someone on the phone, I don't know if this is a human or not, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. and so we I really do that with need- my mom. <laughs> so so we need like a star 411 or like a prompt that we can type in in the chat and say, you know, you know, some sort of signal that says, Mm -hmm. is this real or not? And have the ability, this is the worst when you try to call someone and then you get the whole recorded messages. There should be by default, like some sort of, you know, star six or something like that, or star four, one, one, that you, that they force them to actually have you talk to a human. Right. And so we're getting to the point where AI is, is prov- and it's going to get worse because of the generative aspect that they can actually on the fly kind of try to solve your tech support problem, et cetera. But at some point, got to say, bang, I need to talk to a real person right here because I'm not getting in, in anywhere. And the same, same thing with text and images. We need to, the ability to know, is this photo of uh, XYZ politicians slipping on a banana, is it real or was it created by AI? There you go. Uh, and we're already seeing that politician defakes and different things. Yep. You know, uh, some of the things you've, you've covered, I actually had a friend who, uh, and, and he was just trying to be funny and interesting because I'm pretty funny on Facebook. Or I, I think I'm funny. Let's put it that way. I'm a megalomaniac and narcissist, I guess. I think he's funny. And so uh, I posted something that was, I don't know, whatever I was bitching about or rapping about or whatever. I usually try and do snarky stuff on our, our, our stuff I see as ironic or silly in human nature. And so it was a private post. I've had to, I've had to start privatizing all my Facebook cause I get all these, uh, AI, I, I guess they're AI or they're, they're these bots that are clearly run out of probably Africa and, and Nigeria that, you know, they look like some sort of Asian young lady. And, uh, you know, there's, they're clearly, that's not who is writing me and they're always hijacking the comments. So I've, I've had to move to privacy. Um, and, uh, so I had a friend actually take one of my things that I said, which is kind of critical and I didn't want to put out in the public sphere and he put it into, uh, chat GPT. The post was marked private. He put, he put the thing into chat GPT and told it to write kind of a funny spin on what Chris Voss was defining here and what Chris Voss is about. And I'm like, and when he reposted my comments, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Did you just take something that's private to me and put it into chat GPT? And now that shit is buying what's real. And so, uh, you know, we, we have that probably coming more in the future where, you know, politicians will be seen, you know, uh, maybe having heart attacks or faking health problems or whatever the case may be. It's probably going to get really weird by 2024 presidential elections. Absolutely. I mean, the, we do need a kind of a bill of rights and it starts with having nutrition labels, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so if you kind of look at the evolution of like food safety or, or car safety, this is all consumer protection. It first started with a label that says, you know, 80% of this was created by, by AI. Um, mm-hmm. And then it gets into transparency. The, is this AI or not with 
my proposal to be able to ask the AI, they can, with also the, the, they can't keep the information. So if I have a, a text document that I want to say, did you generate or not, they can't turn around and start using it themselves. So that's, that's part of the proposal that I put forth in the book. Yeah. But, but the whole thing is, is that it's about guardrails and, you know, the same evolution that happened with like car safety. Like, you know, if you have a kid, a young baby, you wouldn't, probably just have them in the lap you probably would have the the whole baby seat etc uh you know uh, wipers airbags etc and, and we we need wipers airbags uh kids car seats um you know as with with ai uh and this technology as well and and just of course yeah the automobile industry 50 years ago they didn't want to put a wiper that worked on or, or seat they, belt or seat belt and all that stuff because that would add 30 cents of uh, to the production or whatever but it's look we're not trying to i'm not proposing that we make the tech industry like the air- airline industry where it's you know, but we need to make it more like the car industry, where mm-hmm. there's rules to the road, there's some basic safety with the actual equipment, um, et cetera. And that's what we need to do is we need to empower both individuals as well as tell policymakers that this AI wave is coming and you got to do something because, boy, it's going to be really bad uh, if we don't jump in here. There you go. Uh, is it Section 230, the law that gives uh, social media networks kind of some real leeway? And we had some challenges that with the uh, 2016 election and the uh, January 6th and other different things. Uh, what do you think about that law? Does that law need to be updated or changed? Or Yeah. So that's uh, the law is called the, the CDA, right? And uh, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. And it basically is like the Magna Carta of the Internet, which is that uh, that if you're a platform provider, you do not have to worry about what is actually posted. So you're you're not technically like a publisher, like if the uh, New York Times, you know, posted something they could that or Fox News, like what recently happened, they could be sued for defamation. But basically, Mm -hmm. but on the the Facebook platform, you know, Google, YouTube, if the same type of things that were posted about Dominion and all that stuff was there, Google's like, hey, we're not a publisher. Section 230 protects us, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I understand. And so uh, it hasn't been whacked away and it has allowed these large tech platforms not to have to worry about content curation. Mm-hmm. But we're now in a situation in which algorithms are amplifying the content. And so I think the fundamental issue is, is that when you have algorithms amplifying content, does that not actually start leading them into becoming an actual publisher because they're putting their thumb on the scale of what content gets seen or not? Um, and so th- that's the interesting debate that we have. And I, I do think that there can be some reforms to Section 230, again, and it, which is basically the consumers need to have rights to, if they see something on the platform, they have to, they should have the right to object and have the tech company respond in a timely manner, as opposed to basically getting poop em- emojis coming back and saying, we don't care. Right. Yeah. We've seen the viral, you know, the, it, it, they always claim, well, there's no way we can catch these Facebook live videos. And, you know, as soon as something starts going crazy, but I don't know, maybe they're getting better at, but maybe it seems like, you know, TikTok knows within a few different adjustments that I make that it will change the algorithm for me. I can manipulate the algorithm. Yeah. And, and just by what I watch, and if I watch about five videos of like, I don't know, like I started watching some of the Maui, Hawaii fires last night. Because I, you know, I was really uh, heartfelt about uh, the crisis that was going on there with the, everything burning, and of course, naturally, my feed changed. It's it's all you know Hawaii stuff and things mm-hmm. burning, and uh, so I was able to basically tune in, if you will. Uh, and, and what's interesting to me is, you know, we've seen these uh, these uh, terrorist shooters that have gone onto Facebook and shot up uh, churches and different things, yeah. uh, streaming it live, and they're like, "Well, there's no way we can catch that." And you're like, I can change the algorithm as, 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 uh, on my own. Recently, uh, just today, they were talking today about uh, Biden, uh, President Biden was coming to Utah. Uh, there was somebody online who started threatening uh, the, the, to you know, possibly go after him with weapons and, and do harm. And, of course, the social media people, I guess, 
picked up on it, alerted the FBI and, and all that good stuff. So they, they have ways of identifying this stuff. It's just whether they really care enough or want to have that semblance enough to go, uh, you know, is, is more harm bad than good, I guess. It, it, look, I, we should have freedom of speech, but there mm-hmm. shouldn't be freedom of amplification and, 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 and reach. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the funny thing is, is that within 10 seconds of you looking for a red shoe, Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, yeah. every website has the red shoe. So if they're smart enough to do within ten seconds, figure that out. I, I agree with you. They they just need there need to be needs to be more pushing. Um, and 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 one way you can do it is you can uh, require some of the information to be made available to researchers for analysis that can feed back. And they've been blocking that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing is, is that there should be kind of a customer complaint um, where they do have to respond to that. And th- you could also limit the complaints to say, these are the hundred organizations that have been vetted and these are the ones that we'll listen to mm-hmm. and they can do the filtering as well. So there there are solutions to this, right? I, I, look, I don't want to, you know, the, the internet, people can spout out crazy ideas, et cetera, but those, you know, and just like someone can walk around and swing a stick as they walk down the street, but it ends at the tip of my nose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so I think that, and there needs to be a mechanism for empowering consumers to be able to flag this uh, and maybe to one of these hundred organizations that analyzes it and then officially gives the, uh, you know, a feedback to to Meta or Google or whomever, et cetera. So there does need to be amendments uh, to the CDA, which has that Section 230 that gives them kind of carte blanche to not be considered a publisher. There you go. Uh, you know, I, I saw, like, I, I don't know where the, the – these are – they're fairly timely, fairly old. Uh, not two, but maybe three or four years ago, somebody – uh, some some very big name uh, news agencies had done the digging, and they'd found that uh, they did some experimenting too. And I think they work with some agencies that uh, deal with child trafficking. But they found that as as soon as young people join uh, Instagram that are underage, uh, they will start getting immediately start getting swamped by predators yes. and and everything else. And it's like it's like I think they timed it. It was like within 15 minutes to a half an hour. Yeah. And I talk about that in the book containing big tech and the chapter on kids safety. Mm-hmm. And it goes to the point where Instagram wants network effects. And so by default, the switch is set to public mm-hmm. for new accounts. Right. And so there and uh, California actually passed a law last year called the Age Appropriate Design Code (AADC), which is based on a UK regulation that actually mandates that for uh, kids under 18 that the settings should, by default, be set to private versus public. Right? Wow. The other, like, here's another example: you should be, you should, these tech companies should be banned from sending notifications after 10 p.m. at night for maybe kids up to 16 and maybe up to midnight for kids under 18. They can do that, right? Because wow. there's nothing worse like, uh, you know, I mean, you and I probably deal with this. Or like our phone is going off with notifications at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. But uh, we're, we're, we're used to just like, oh, just forget about it. But, but a kid, it's like, oh, my God, what if a friend posted and I don't respond with a smiley face within 30 seconds? Am I going to lose the friendship? So there are ways that you can design tech products with kids in mind, much like we've made that evolution with kids online safety in the physical world. We should we should do that as well. And those are a couple of examples that 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 you did a great job of highlighting this like you need to make these accounts private by default. And it's up to the tech companies to do it. Yeah. We've even had people on the show that talk about ways to protect your kids where, you know, you make sure that they don't post anything that shows a background that might give their location. Uh, you know, even X, it was X fill tags on photos, their telocations, yes. uh, you know, make sure that, you know, you have that blocked. Uh, I've, uh, we've had some people on the show that have talked about different ways to protect your children. And it, it's interesting to me and what I'm leading up to is, you know, as, as human beings, we, we assess and evaluate the wrong things. You know, we, we think about, you know, 
like a, a terrorist is going to blow us up. Well, the ob- odds of that, you know, the odds se- sequence of just about anything we over amplify uh, and we worry about the wrong things, you know, like, like maybe um, we, we need to, but what I'm trying to get to is we need to demand more of our politicians and demand more of them to look into this, more of them to design rights, you know, and we get led around by the nose by a lot of these, you know, buzz pol- political things. And maybe, regulating some of the stuff that we've talked about today especially for kids etc cetera, etc cetera, protecting you know maybe helping regulate some of the dopamine hits that are because i know people that are addicted to the dopamine hit yeah uh and and the likes and the attention and the validation they get uh a lot of women are wrapped up in that it's it's it, you know they're just constantly in their phones and that attention that dopamine hit there are people that are literally addicted to it. They can't put their phones down. They can't live without them. Um, but we need to demand more of our politicians. You know, maybe maybe having somebody from the LGBT community read to your kids at a school isn't quite as dangerous as, or even dangerous as, you know, your kid being on social media and you don't know who's talking to him in their DMs. You know? Well, look, I mean, the there was a lot of concern about TikTok because in the end, the parent company is China based and like, yeah. oh, my God, all the, the people in China, you know, these this Chinese government could get access to your 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 swipes and your likes and all that stuff. But but the funny thing is the same data collection is being done by Meta, Google, <laughs> Snapchat, et cetera. Right. And there's nothing stopping a third party entity from using a credit card to advertise and push you in certain directions. Um, and so it's it's fundamentally, you know, we need data privacy rights and we as consumers need to reduce the, the digital exhaust that we give out. Um, and, and that's just so critical uh, in today's digital age. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Just the, the level of addictiveness of, of technology, uh, it's, just, it's just out of control and I just, I, I worry most about kids that don't have the the natural that you know if we see a rabbit hole or we see as you said some people that are from you know that are posting things that that you you can probably immediately tell that that's not yeah. a re- real person mm-hmm. uh, but you know a 13 year old kid that gets a high from someone they don't know who it is right yeah. they don't they don't have the guardrails and that's scary I remember like 10 or 15 years ago, I, I, my, my sister was complaining about her computer and I was like, what's going on? Yeah, it's not working well. Can you help me with it? So I, I went over to her place and she had like 20, uh, of those button bars. Remember those button bars were like the thing. And she had 20 of them actively working that covered half the screen. And I'm like, how do you use this thing? But she, you know, she signed up for everything. <laughs> Yeah, no, it goes back. I think we do need just like, you know, you and I went to shop class to learn, you know, put the glasses on, learn how to cut a piece of wood. And uh, of course, typewriting, my favorite course. Boom, 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 boom. The only thing I learned in the school that had any value. Yeah, well, typing the typewriting uh, course was the best for me. But yeah, uh, yeah no, I think uh, we, we do need to raise awareness um, mm-hmm. of, of these issues and start it young. And I think also we need to have a class that teaches what this does to our brain. Like we've had yeah. neurologists on that have talked about this and the dopamine hit, the the fear of missing out and, you know, the emotions it creates. You know, there's a lot of young girls that they've, they've uh, done articles on that have talked about the depression that they feel oh, gosh, yes. because, uh, you know, you're able to go, well, I don't look like. Uh, the, the this girl and that girl and you know and then the infighting the competition you know there's there's people that commit suicide over you know uh, some sort of attack or even there were suicides of young boys who uh had gotten fished by predators and then told that they were going to exploit their photos and you know they were they, these kids were i think under 10 or teenagers yeah and they off themselves because over the shame Anyway, uh, I, I, I highly recommend people look at your book and understand what's going on, read it, and all that good stuff. Give me your dot .com, uh, Tom, so people can find out more in the internet. Yeah, it's tomkemp.ai, T-O-M-K-E-M-P.ai, and you can just mm-hmm. click there to uh, order the book. It's uh, going to be out on August 22nd, but it's fully available for pre-order. It's an ebook, audiobook, and then good old paper. 
There you go. Demand more from everybody. Our politicians, you know, uh, help with the economy, democracy, and civil rights. These are all important things. And 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 understand how how bad you're being spied on. Order the book wherever fine books are sold. It's available August twenty second, twenty twenty three. Containing big tech: How to protect our civil rights, economy, and democracy. Something everyone should really be thinking about because AI is kind of Wow, it just opened the wild west, and and uh, you know every one of these technologies. I remember when I remember when Twitter came out, and we're like, "Hey, we can talk to everyone in the world and kumbaya." And it's uh, John Lennon's "Imagine," which song I love, and we can all be one big happy family. And you know, between uh, governments who went, "What? You open a Pandora's box? Let's we'll see what we can do with that thing." Some evil, and uh, and then Mark Zuckerberg, oh throw some shit there uh so anyway uh order of the book where fine books are sold thanks for honest for tuning in go to goodreads.com for says chris Voss, linkedin.com for says chris Voss, all those places we are on the internet thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe and we'll see you next time <laughs>